former NFL quarterback. He was Rookie of the Year with Washington, and his podcast is Out of Pocket with RG3, who joins us back on the program. Good to have you on. Um, what did you see last night? Where do, where do you want to start? Dan, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for, for having me on, man. Uh, always a big fan of you guys. Always been great to me. So, uh, I mean, the question is, where do you want to start? I mean, there was so much that happened in that game. All right. Well, let me start with Jaden Daniels. And I want to know, with being a rookie quarterback, most important element of a rookie quarterback, is it the head coach, the offensive coordinator, or is it the tools around the quarterback, if you had to pick one of those three? Yeah, you know, Dan, I think it's all three. Um, to answer your question specifically, uh, I think it's uh, the tools around the quarterback. But I think that goes for not just a rookie QB, but for any quarterback. Um, you know, for him to have scary Terry McLaurin there, uh, a true bona fide number one wide receiver, uh, to have Austin Eckler there. I know he went out in the game uh, with the concussion, but his presence there on third downs throughout the season uh, has been phenomenal. Of course, Brian Robinson also being there. And then Zach Ertz. We mentioned all these guys, and every single one of them showed up big uh, in the game. Scary Terry had the big catch at the end. He also had the 55-yard completion early in the game, uh, taking the top off the defense. Zach Ertz had the, the huge fourth down conversion, and Eckler had the huge kickoff return. But, you know, for me, it's with Jaden Daniels, it's like a star wasn't born last night because he was already a star, uh, but he is now the brightest light that we have coming out of Washington, D.C., uh, and that includes anyone who becomes the president of the United States, uh, because in D.C. there's no better city. There's no better city to win in, in my opinion, than in Washington D.C. Well, the star didn't come out. We validated the star. It feels <laughs> like because it's sort of a standalone game. And yeah. now, if this is a one o'clock game on Sunday, people might go, "Oh, I saw the highlights." Yes. When you you need to see the totality of a game, certainly with a rookie, to go, he had a good game or he didn't have a good game because stats can lie when we just show the highlights there. Yes. Can you can you run smart? Like, how do you run smart if you're Jaden Daniels? Yeah, I mean, I think his game is more than just the running, Dan. You know, when when you look at the way that it that it went, um, first and foremost, I think Jaden Daniels gives DC hope hope they haven't had in over a decade. Uh, and that shows up when he makes the big throw down the field to Terry McLaurin, even though they're in quarters coverage. Uh, and he looks off the safety. He doesn't just stare him down, and he makes that throw. And if you actually go back and watch the tape, he made that throw slightly late, which shows you how much arm talent he has and how much arm strength he has, that he was able to make up for being just a, like a half a second late on the throw to drop a diamond to scare Terry McLaurin. But I know there's a lot of people out there breaking down tape, Dan, uh, and I just have to say that unless you play the position, you'll never understand how special of a performance what Jaden Daniels did last night was on um, fourth and four on since he's 39 yard line. And they're trying to determine, are they going to go for it? He tells the coach, let's go, has ice in his veins and completes a nice stop route to Zach Ertz for a first down. And then, of course, I think everyone's broken down the touchdown pass, you know, at the end against cover zero. Everyone in the world, in the football world, should I say, knew that Lou Anarumo was going to call cover zero. And for Cliff Kingsbury to have the cojones to trust his rookie quarterback to throw a double move against cover zero shows you how much the coaches there in that organization believe in Jaden Daniels. But then the throw itself, him having his eyes in the right place, gaining depth out of the drop to make sure he had enough time to stare down the barrel of the shotgun, knowing that he's going to get hit, waits just long enough and still makes the throw. I think what a lot of people don't understand is he didn't even see how much of a dime he threw Dan until his friends and family showed him after the game. <laughs> That's how hard he got hit. And you know they weren't showing yeah. that replay in Cincy. So for him yeah. to make that type of play in that moment, to me, it wipes out all the conversation about how does he run? You know, Is there a safe way to run? Because what he showcased last night was his prowess as a thrower. And I was trying to stress that to everybody in the offseason. Yes, he's the most dynamic runner in all of college football, but he was also the most dynamic passer, throwing the football down the field. And he showed that off time and time again against the Bengals. You think he's better than Caleb Williams? That's a great question. But I, I, I stated very specifically that I thought Caleb Williams uh, was the number one quarterback in the draft 
but that I believe that Jaden Daniel was the most explosive quarterback, both as a runner and as a passer. And I think that's, to me, Dan, you know how this thing goes and how the draft, you know, formulates and how all the storylines get created. But this isn't a Caleb Williams versus uh, Jaden Daniels thing to me. This isn't a C.J. Stroud versus Bryce Young. I think it's a battle or a fight upon expectations. And when you give a quarterback like Caleb Williams, who's ultra talented, been working since he's six years old to be in this position, you give him three number one wide receivers, a dynamic running back, a solid offensive line, and a defense that everybody expected to be top 10, expectations are through the roof. So now he's playing like a rookie. They're one and two, and people are panicking. For Jaden Daniels in, in Washington, there were no expectations. I don't know who you picked for the game, Dan, but I don't think anybody picked Washington other than myself and true Washington Commanders fans. So he has taken an opportunity where there was no expectations, and now he's turned it into an opportunity to lead not just a team, but an entire city. So I think that's where the comparison between him and Caleb Williams kind of goes awry because they're in two totally different situations with totally different expectations. He's RG3. His podcast on YouTube is out of pocket with RG3 wherever you get your podcast. What's different about Josh Allen with this team that it doesn't seem like they have the manpower on defense. They lose Stefan Diggs. He's playing great. Yes. So, Dan... It's the old cliche, or I wouldn't say cliche, but when you have a true number one wide receiver um, like a Stephon Diggs, there's, a, there's an expectation, once again, for you to throw him the football, right? Everything has to start with that guy because if it doesn't, it can kind of throw your team off, and he's so talented that you want to get him the football 10, 12, 15 times a game or at least get him the, that many targets. I think for Josh Allen, a, a big uh, he's had a, a chance to take a big, deep breath right? Get that monkey off his back of you have to throw the football to this guy consistently all the time. And now he's able to just drop back, go through his progressions, make his reads and get the football to the right guy. And I look at this as the same situation. And I also brought this up in the off season. It's the same situation that Mahomes had with Tyreek Hill. Once Tyreek Hill left, Mahomes now had to go through his reads, and he had he even talked about it. He had to read defenses a lot more uh, studiously so that he could get the ball to where it's supposed to go instead of dropping back and saying, hey, Tyreek Hill's got to be open somewhere down there. So now Josh Allen is proving that their offense can be more efficient without Stephon Diggs, and it's helping him as a player because he doesn't have that that, you know, the one angel on his shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder saying, the devil's like, hey, you got to throw the step on this all the time. And the agent's like, no, <laughs> read the coverage. It's cover four. Don't throw the post unless the safety takes the out route. So I think Josh Allen is experiencing that. And it was good to see Keon Coleman actually get his first NFL touchdown as well, because I believe he can turn into that number one wide out. But in the meantime, I think Josh Allen's having more fun playing football. Yeah, you talk about an interesting luxury, but it's a dichotomy or conundrum. It's, I got to keep that guy happy. And I thought this was the detriment of Baker Mayfield in Cleveland with OBJ that he kept having, you know, you got to keep him happy. That's your guy. And then it's to the detriment of you. And and you see this with quarterbacks and you bring up the great point. You lose Tyree Kill and Mahomes became an even better quarterback. Speaking of which, Trevor Lawrence, (laughs) keep waiting. (laughs) <laughs> we keep waiting. Um, what? And he doesn't get a lot of coverage, you know, like negative coverage. Correct. Why? Oh, man, Dan, that's a – that is – this is why you're one of the best, man, because those, those – it's a great question. Um, I think part of the reason is he's in Jacksonville, and Jacksonville's not a, a big market team, whereas if he was in New York – or D.C., um, that he would certainly get negative coverage. Uh, It's kind of the same reason he got paid, right? If you look at what he got paid for what he had produced on the field, those don't add up. And I don't think anyone with, you know, who's thinking clearly would say that, yeah, that adds up. I'm not trying to take money away from anybody. I'm happy he got paid. I'm happy Daniel Jones. Jones got paid. Should they have? Probably not, right? They probably should have had more years to prove that they were the guy. 
But when you're a guy like Trevor Lawrence, you come out of high school as a top rated prospect, you go to Clemson and you and you're a top rated prospect coming out as well. There's a little more leniency. And he has all the size, the strength, the measurables, the the beautiful, luscious hair, head and shoulders hair, you know. But I, I don't I don't understand why he doesn't get more negative coverage in the sense of constructive criticism. I, you know me, I'm not a negative guy. I will constructively criticize guys and say, hey, your feet aren't matching up. You're not making the right throws. You're trying to force this in there. And I think right now Trevor Lawrence is trying to prove why they paid him when I don't think that's how you should ever play the quarterback position. For, for instance, we're not talking about him anymore, but, but Jaden Daniels. He has this uncanny ability to not try to do too much. I know as a runner, he can, you know, maybe slide a little bit earlier, not take some hits, but to have the highest completion percentage ever for a a rookie quarterback in a game at 91.3% was beyond incredible. But when you watch the actual game, he's just taking what the defense gives him. And I think for Trevor Lawrence, that's what he has to get back to. It's not playing conservatively and it's not playing scared. It's playing the position the right way. When it's time to take a shot, take the shot. When it's time to throw the check down, throw the dang check down. And I think that's how he can get himself back into playing in a better rhythm. And people will stop questioning why he got paid and what's going on in Jacksonville. I'm also trying to understand the Dolphins' philosophy. I wouldn't have extended Tua. Really? Because I can't hold my breath. I, I, yeah, I, I, I know that he had a wonderful year. I, I can't live play-to-play with him. And if I do extend him, then I really have to go after a quarterback who can play this system and is a viable backup. Now, Mm -hmm. that's where I would have said to Tua, you're going to take less money, and i got to make sure I have a great backup in case you get injured. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. I can't extend you. It just, to me, it didn't make sense. And I know that he had a wonderful year. Yeah. I just, and now this situation, they don't have a good backup. I don't know if you you ask Pittsburgh, would you trade Russell Wilson? Like, this is a team that's ready to win now, supposed to win now. So where do you stand on this Dolphins situation? Oh, you know, if you look at Tua in a vacuum, right, no outside influences, I think you, you have some solid points. Hey, he's had some concussion issues. Uh, we don't and some other injury issues. You know, can we really can we really trust that he's going to stay healthy? Those are all solid points. But when you take in all the outside context, and we just talked about a guy in Trevor Lawrence who got paid, who had a good year two years ago, two has put together two top five quarterback seasons. So he had earned the money and earned the right to get paid at that level. But your point about the backup QB is why the backup quarterback is is the second most important position on any team. Because for years, we've heard people say, since Mike McDaniel got there, anybody can run this system. Anybody can throw the ball to Tyreek Hill. Anybody can throw the ball to Jalen Waddle. Anybody can hand the ball off to A-Chain and, and, and Mostert. And now you see that that's not really the case. So for me, I'm, you know, one, I don't think anybody should, should be... Everybody can have an opinion, right, Dan? I don't think anybody should be telling Tua what he should do with his career. That's his decision. He's the only one that can make that decision. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. now with them in the quarterback position, Skylar Thompson goes down. You got Tim Boyle out there. Snoop Huntley is on the team. They just claimed him from from the uh, the Ravens practice squad. Who is going to be able to run this system the right way? I don't know, but none of them are going to be Tua Tunga Bailoa. And if you were to say, hey, well, the starter got hurt. The backup's not as good. Everyone would tell you, yeah, well, no, duh. But this is why the veteran quarterback is so important in the NFL. Andy Dalton in Carolina, mm-hmm. why did why was he so successful? It's not because the Carolina Panthers or Dave Canales or Dan Morgan developed him as a player, right? He's been in the league for 90 years, okay? <laughs> he and he's and he's played at a high level at times, especially when he was the, the starter for the Cincinnati Bengals. But you need guys like Andy Dalton in the quarterback room because if your quarterback does go down, you know that you have a quarterback that can make you a playoff contender. And we don't know that. We didn't know that about Skylar Thompson. We don't know that about Tim Boyle. I'm I'm pretty interested in seeing Snoop Huntley out there, former teammate, love him. But we don't know that about him either. 
So their situation is, you know, they're up a creek without a paddle without Tua because of what they did at the backup quarterback position. And you can't fix that now. Trading for Russell Wilson, who has a calf injury, you're going to trade for a guy that that that's not healthy, you know? No, I've once heard- he's cleared, once okay. he's cleared, would you uh, – Adam Schefter said Zach Wilson to bring him in in that situation. You, okay, so how do you feel about that, Dan? I don't – I don't know how you did the same as you. You just okay. haven't said it. You're you're telling okay. me. You're saying it right to me. Before I yes. let you go, I thought about this. If I lined you up at your peak. Yeah. Against Tyreek Hill. Oh wow. Okay. Who wins? Let's go a hundred meters. Yeah. Who wins? Tyreek wins the hundred. Yeah, he's a he's a ten ten one hundred guy out of high school. Okay. And, you know, and at my peak and at his peak. I was a 10 100 guy as well, but at his peak, he he wins the hundred. Any what anything about the else? 60? Any ah, I think if you go down, it's it's favoring him personally. Okay. 60, 40, okay. 100 him. Anything over 200, I win hands down. 200 is actually a lot closer than you think. Um, even though I know he was a great 200 meter runner, but uh, you know Tyreek is he's next level. I do think that he could he could beat Noah Lyles uh, in a 40 though. I think a 60 no allows beats him. But in, in a 40, I think that, that no allows can beat him. I mean, that too, that Tyreek just, can beat Noah. Just because Noah gets a slow start and and Tyreek is so great. I mean, he gets into top gear as quick, if not quicker, than anybody. Yeah, I would tell you, go look at uh, Tyreek's 60 that he ran a few years ago and look at, obviously, Noah's PR in the 60. They're not close as far as, like, in track terms or times. Mm-hmm. But if you bring that down to a 40... Yeah, uh, Tyreek definitely has a chance there because that, like you said, that's not the strongest part uh, of No Laws' race. I mean, of uh, yeah, of No Laws' race. What's it like to run fast? <laughs> uh, well, you know, Dan, I actually raced uh, an F1 car like a few months ago, and I don't mean like in the like driver's seat. I mean like on foot. So. I was actually winning for like 30 yards. I was very proud of myself, Dan. And then the last 10, I was like running and I could see the car like seven blocks away. It was funny. But to run fast, it's like, you know, you see the, the images of the dogs running and like their ears are flapping and the wind is blowing in their face. That's what it feels like to run fast. The wind is just, you just feel that. And uh, I hope you've experienced that at least no, one I time in your life. I, I haven't. <laughs> I, I, the one thing I experienced, and I tell the Danettes this, I was in London for the Olympics and saw Bolt run the 200. And when you watch somebody, you know, TV will frame it so it, you don't really get an idea of how fast they're running. They're okay. running fast, but the camera stays with you. I'm on the turn, and Bolt – is coming around the turn, and I said to my wife, I said, the race is over. And she goes, it's over? I said, no, (laughs) it's going to be over because if you didn't get him, you didn't – you get him there, you weren't getting him. The the visual is incredible to watch somebody, the fastest man in the world in history, and when he makes that turn, the camera's not on him. My TV's not on him that way. It's just me watching him, and, and it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, it's why a lot of people in the track world get upset when people talk about, hey, this football player is the fastest guy in the world or whatever it may be, because they understand not just Usain Bolt, but just how fast these track athletes are. Like DK Metcalf, when he ran a few years ago and ended up getting last in that race, and there was no premier runners in that race. Then you see uh, the pole vaulter, Mondo Duplantis, goes out and runs the a faster time than DK Metcalf did in the hundred as a pole vaulter, right? It's crazy. But Dan, I know you got, I know you got to let me go and you got to get, you got to move on and you're doing a great job with your show. Can I tell one last story about Jaden Daniels? Okay. They're playing the bucks week one and they got blown out. So Jaden Daniels is a guy that, that I mentor and I enjoy my conversations with him because of how dynamic of a player he is, but how good of a person he is as well. And if you remember in that game late in the fourth quarter, he scored his second rushing touchdown and he didn't celebrate. And I, I was talking to him about it. And for me, it was like, that's all I needed to see to know where this kid is going to go because he's not focused on anything else but winning because winning is the standard. His whole team wanted to celebrate the touchdown run. 
And he waved them off. Like, this is not what we're about. And when I talked to him after that game, that's what he said to me. The standard is winning. I'm not, I'm not here for individual stats and individual accomplishments, even though it's really cool that his first touchdown pass was to an offensive lineman. Pretty awesome stuff, right? <laughs> but I knew in that moment that not only this kid is, is, a, is a star and he's exactly what the Washington Commanders need, but I truly believe that he can be the best quarterback the Washington Commanders franchise has ever had. And I know that's a lot to say after just three games, but watching him, the way that he's processing his feet are in rhythm, how he's not trying to do too much, and he's just taking what the defense gives him, that's a recipe for long-term success. And I'm very excited because Washington deserves this. The fan base, the city, they deserve a quarterback been like Jaden Daniels, and they've been through a lot over the years. So I'm very excited. That's why I got my Sean Taylor jersey on right now because this is, uh, this is exactly what the city needed.